Oh, hello there. This is the story of how people invented prisons because they thought they were good, but then it turned out they were actually bad. In the olden days, prisons were just a place to put people whilst you were deciding how to punish them. They were only used occasionally as a punishment for people who couldn't pay fines. Punishment for more serious crimes was always enacted on the body and was largely a theatrical display of the sovereign's or state's power over its subjects. America inherited this justice system from the British, and kept it for about a century after Europe got all into prison reform. Old prisons were dirty and cramped, and often criticised for being disease-ridden and chaotic, and for the prisoners having easy access to alcohol and prostitutes. Sometimes, as a prisoner, you were free to just go in and out of prison as you wanted to, and you could eat and drink whatever you felt like, providing you could afford it. Americans started to get into reforming their smelly old prisons around the turn of the 19th century. They were quite a way behind, as Europe had already rolled out their prison reforms to the colonies in the second half of the 18th century. Prisons as we know them today were created from reforms, and reform has been the name of the game ever since. The initial prison reforms were motivated by a few strands of thought, so let's take a look at some of those. The Enlightenment consisted of some Whig men having stupid ideas. One of these ideas was seeing individuals, i.e. other Whig men, as bearing inalienable rights. Before this it was hard to see prison as a form of punishment. Banishment beyond a town's limits would have made sense, but imprisonment, not so much. Prisons punish you by putting restrictions on your rights, and that's not really a punishment when you don't think of things in terms of rights. The old justice system was a bit of a mess of irrational rituals. There was little consistency in punishments, and the condemned could be freed as they stood on the gallows if the crowd protested loudly enough. The Whig men really loved rationality, so they couldn't stand for this nonsense. Instead, they sought to give consistent punishments, aiming to impose order, classification, cleanliness, good work habits and self-consciousness. This played into the creation and maintenance of a large orderly urban labour force, seeking to regulate all people rather than just punish particularly egregious transgressors. You can see this regulation in the way prison sentences came to be calculated in time in an era where there was a move to the value of labour being calculated in time and compensated in money. The new prison system was an important step in the transfer of power from the old justice of the aristocracy to the new justice of the bourgeoisie. Equally, the new prisons were matchly inspired by religious ideas of rehabilitation through solitary self-reflection and labour. Whilst solitary confinement is now thought of as one of the worst punishments possible, then it was often considered to have an emancipatory effect. Through this influence, the prison system became a mix of penitence and punishment, an attempt to reshape habits and cells. The first state penitentiary was built in Pennsylvania in 1790, when part of Walnut Street Jail was converted. It was built as a series of single cells where prisoners lived, ate, worked, read the Bible, if they were literate, and were supposed to reflect and repent. Most prisons later kept a similar design, but made labour communal, they still conducted in silence. The architecture of the modern prison took a lot from the structure of monasteries, with their single cells and focus on silent reflection. The first panopticon was built in the Western State Penitentiary in Pittsburgh in 1826. That fact doesn't really fit, but I just thought it was interesting. A panopticon is a crazy kind of prison where a single guard can potentially observe any of the prisoners at any time, but they can't know when, because of like mirrors and stuff. I'm going to ask that blob creature over there what it was like down south. Hello, Blob Creature. Could you tell me about the Black Codes? Most certainly. After the abolition of slavery, the South was quick to introduce the Black Codes, which criminalised things like vagrancy, absence from work, breach of job contracts, possessions of firearms, and insulting gestures and acts, but only for black people. Equally, after emancipation, many black people were forced to steal in order to eat. It was at this time that petty theft was made a felony, condemning significantly more black people to prison. 
These charges of theft were frequently fabricated. After emancipation, the courtroom became an ideal place to exact racial retribution. So the numbers of black convicts shut up? Like crazy. Before the abolition of slavery, 99% of those in Alabama's penitentiaries were white. But with the black codes, this quickly shifted to being mostly black. <laughs> Whilst the penitentiaries of the North to some extent mimicked the slave system, in the South they were very much a literal continuation with the development of the convict lease system, where black prisoners were rented as gangs to the plantation owners who would have previously relied on slave labour. The convict lease system was a kind of reincarnation of slavery. Southern whites carried over from slavery the thoughts that black people could only work in gangs under constant threat from the whip, and applied this to the black chain gangs of the convict lease system, introducing methods of intense surveillance and discipline to the precursors of the prison system. The conditions in the convict lease system were often worse than those of slavery. Slave owners were concerned with the health and survival of their slaves, as they represented a significant financial investment, but they were often quite happy to work convicts to death in pursuit of profit, as convicts were leased as a group and a few deaths didn't affect profitability. Here's a sample of some records of Mississippi plantations from the 1880s. The prisoners slept on the bare floor without mattresses, some who attempted to escape were whipped till the blood ran down their legs, others had a metal spear riveted to their feet, convicts dropped from exhaustion, pneumonia, malaria, frostbite, consumption, sunstroke, dysentery, gunshot wounds and shackle poisoning, the constant rubbing of chains and leg irons against bare flesh. The convict lease system was an incredibly efficient way of industrializing the South. A lot of infrastructure, like Georgia's railroads, was laid by black convicts. Towards the turn of the 20th century, the convict lease system was faded out, but its replacements in the form of chain gangs and prison farms weren't much better. Conditions in these farms were so bad that, as late as the 1960s, an Oregon judge refused to return escapees from Arkansas, who had been apprehended in his jurisdiction, on the grounds that the farms were just so bad. A former warden described how men in the Georgia camps were hung by their thumbs as punishment, to the point that their thumbs became so stretched and deformed, to the length of index fingers, that they resembled the paws of certain apes. In the 1960s, these forms of punishment were mostly abolished. Through strict regimentation, prison aimed at the reform and transformation of the habits and ethics of inmates. Well, this was the case for men at least. Female criminals were seen as fallen women who had transgressed the fundamental moral principles of womanhood. They couldn't be redeemed through self-reflection and labour, so they just had to be kept away from the general population somewhere. Women were often punished within the domestic domain, as they were often not granted rights in the public sphere. Thus, their punishment was in the same place as their role. The 1800s saw campaigns for separate women's prisons pick up. People argued that fallen women could be redeemed through learning domesticity. They advocated for separate women's prisons where cells were to be replaced by cottages and rooms which would infuse domesticity into women criminals. They also argued that a female custodial staff would minimise sexual temptations, which they believed were often at the root of female criminality. They seemed more worried about that than the rampant rapes of female prisoners. Following such campaigns, the first reformatory for women was established in 1853 in London. The US followed suit a little later. After that, women were often given longer sentences than men for the same crimes, since they were not seen as being punished, but being reformed and retrained. Equally, the eugenics movement had something to do with it, advocating for women criminals being kept away from the possibilities to reproduce for as many childbearing years as possible. The imprisonment of women was racialized because that's just what America likes to do. Black and Native American women were often sent to men's prisons, and black women continued to be part of the convict lease system in the South. Reformation and nice little cottage cells were only really for white women. From the 80s, corporate ties to prisons really started to get going. You know, they had to keep up with the latest trends. With this, companies started reaping some major financial benefits from having a larger prison population, and thus got rather a lot of incentive to keep the prison population big. But, not to get too carried away, the vast majority of prisons are still public, and they're bad also. 
Equally, the media got kind of obsessed with crime. From 1990 to 1998, the homicide rate in America halved, but homicide stories on the three major networks rose almost fourfold. Supermaxes started when federal correctional authorities began to send prisoners deemed to be dangerous to the federal prison in Marion, Illinois. In 1983, the entire prison was locked down, with the prisoners confined to their cells for 23 hours a day. This lockdown was made permanent, and from there became the general model for control units in Supermax prisons. By 2011, there were 80,000 inmates in Supermaxes. In Attica, in 1971, there was a prison rebellion. The prisoners wanted a better diet, better guards, more realistic rehabilitation programs, better education programs, religious freedom, freedom to engage in political activity, and an end to censorship. In response, the governor of New York ordered in the National Guard, who killed 43 prisoners and 11 guards and civilians. Pew, 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 pew. In the wake of the massacre, public opinion started to turn in favour of reform. Many of the prisoners were transferred to Greenhaven, which began offering college-level education in 1973, and high-quality prison education started to pick up across the country after that. However, from the 90s onwards, these programs started to be dismantled again, with moves like the 1994 Crime Acts, which removed Pell Grants for prisoners, defunding all higher education courses in prisons. Equally, prison publishing journals collapsed so that only three remained by 2003. This seemed to be something of an official recognition of the shift in the stated function of prisons from the rehabilitative aims of the early reformers to prisons just being a place to store people who aren't deemed useful to society. Going into the 20th century, women were more frequently locked up in psychiatric institutes than prisons. Whilst deviant men were constructed as criminals, deviant women were constructed as insane. The effects of this, coming into the modern day, can be pretty horrifying, particularly within the prison system. Here's a snippet from an interview with a Native American woman who was imprisoned in the Women's Correctional Center in Montana. Hellball is a drug they give people who can't cope with lockup. It makes you feel dead, paralyzed. And then I started getting side effects from Haldol. I wanted to fight anybody, any of the officers. I was screaming at them and telling them to get out of my face. So the doctor said, we can't have that. And they put me on transine. I don't take pills. I've never had trouble sleeping until I got here. Now I'm supposed to see the counselor again because of my dreams. If you've got a problem, they're not going to take care of it. They're going to put you on drugs so they can control you. Prison populations tend to really correlate to race and wealth. In 2009, 3,199 per 100,000 black men were in prison, six times the imprisonment rate per 100,000 people for white men. With such imprisonment rates, we're almost back at the ratio of black to white prisoners that we had under the black codes. Felons, and some ex-felons, are not allowed to vote, and due to how imprisonment targets certain portions of the population, this tends to significantly reduce the voices of certain demographics. In the national elections of 2012, the various state felony disenfranchisement laws together blocked an estimated 5.85 million felons from voting. This is more than enough to swing an awful lot of elections, especially as a number of pretty swingy states like Florida have big prison populations, so it's a population which could have changed a few recent elections. Woo! End of video! Are you thinking that prisons are bad and wondering what you could have in place of them? Good. I'm gonna make some videos about that so you can subscribe and press the ding dong bell if you'd like to see those. Also, whilst watching my last video, someone got a bit too enthusiastic and they pressed the like button just a little bit too hard and it broke. I think I fixed it, but just to check, could you please press it and let me know if it turns blue? Thanks. Bye.